So we're continuing with um, HTML widgets, and we're getting gradually more and more complicated. Today, we kind of learn the um, boilerplate that you need in an R package in order to wrap a JavaScript library um, using HTML widgets and things like how you transfer data over from R to the front end and, and, and stuff. Um, the, the the example in the book is like it's it's like a kind of you know showing some text kind of alert type thing. Um, the next couple of weeks is again there's like gradually more advanced kind of uses of this. Um, so there's no dependencies on like external libraries or anything like that. I mean apart from those within R. Um, yes, and um, Arthur is offered to take us through the uh, contents of the chapter. Um, so for those who are watching along on YouTube, um, and I believe there are a few of you, um, we have been working through a book called JavaScript for R, and um, we are currently at chapter five. Um, if you want to join us to discuss the book, um, we have a um, a channel within Slack and the R for Data Science channel. Um, and um, I mean, you're welcome to join us for the Zoom meetings, but um, yes. Anyway, I'll leave it over to Arthur to, to present this week's contents. But hi, everyone. And uh, I'm glad you could all join us this week. Just a quick check, can you, can you hear me and also see my screen? Okay, yes and yes, yes, good, perfect. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll walk us through uh, this chapter five, which in, in the end, I think is a fairly fairly simple chapter, but I, I think also a necessary one in so far as it um, kind of helps us get used to the basic structure of a, of a widget. Um, uh, and how one goes about creating a widget, and then really kind of what what kind of dark magic is going on <laughs> in the internals of, of, of everything. Like how how is it that we're able to um, uh, work with JavaScript from from R in, in, in a practical sense? Um, so learning objectives uh, for this section is really you know, twofold. First, how to build a minimal widget. Um, it's uh, shockingly simple. Um, uh, and then I'll, I'll, uh, the second one is how each component uh, of, the, uh, of the widget works. Good. Um, so as I said, you know, at the outset, creating a, a simple widget is, is, is really shockingly, maybe even breathtakingly simple. Um, uh, in, in, in really almost with very little exaggeration, you, you can create a widget with, with two lines of code. Um, and, uh, you know, first is simply to create a package. Uh, and then secondly is to create a widget within the package, right? Um, so for the first line of code, I guess for those of, those of you who are familiar with package development, you know, this is one way in which you can, can create a package, probably the easiest, uh, just using the use this package is a create package function that basically creates all of, all of the structure and all of the boilerplate. Uh, for having a viable package. Um, and so if, if you're familiar with that world, then hopefully this comparison will, will make sense. So just as you can create a package with one line of code, basically create all the infrastructure and the boilerplate code, so too can you create a widget with one line of code. So in a sense, HTML widgets, scaffold widgets, does kind of comparable work to what create package does. It creates the files that you need, uh, in order for a minimal widget to work and puts in place some of the boilerplate. So then you need to adapt as, as the developer. Um, and you know, it, 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 it creates, as we'll see shortly, um, uh, it, it creates kind of three files for your widget. So one, one is going to be an R file, um, whose job it is is really to kind of capture uh, parameters from R and pass them to JavaScript. Uh, a second file, which is a JavaScript file that has a, kind of the same name, like let's imagine I have a widget called my widget. Um, my widget.js would be basically the functions 
that are in JavaScript that are going to take the parameters from R and do something uh, in, in the browser. And then lastly, uh, this, uh, this, this file, uh, mywidget.yaml, which in a sense is sort of like the, the, the description file, uh, for, well, it, it is kind of a canon, is, is the, the widget, let's say what a, a description file is for an R package. It lists the set of dependencies, the things upon which your widget depends, the external dependencies. So for example, if we have uh, a JavaScript uh, library that, um, requires jQuery, then we need to kind of list the library itself as well as as well as jQuery. So we need to say list out all of all of the dependencies uh, for, for for our particular widget. Um, since I think the way live demos is a is a lot more helpful than than perhaps the just kind of going through some slides. Let me kind of go through go through a live demo where I'll, I'll try I'll endeavor to touch on all the points that are that are in the slides. I guess another kind of quick check-in um, uh, lesson that I'm, is, uh, is my R Studio instance, is, is the type uh, base like large enough or should I increase its size? It, it's okay for you, Russ? It's okay? All right, fairly. Um, if it becomes unreadable at any point, let me know and I can, I can increase the size. So I'm just going to create um, a, a package um, called my package. Here, use this does all of its all of its magic. Um, yeah. Creating creating the package, uh, setting the directory, creating R an R folder, a description file with the, the, the following contents, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're familiar at all with package development, this is all this is all old hat for you. Um, actually, let me move over now to this, and I'll just kill this session of R. So now I'm in I'm in my package. So notice the project I have open is my package. This is now this is now my the, the package that we're, we're, we're creating. Um, the next the next step uh, actually let me just give you a little overview. So you know if you're slightly unfamiliar with packages, you'll find here all the things you'd expect for a package. You've got the as I mentioned, you've got the R folder which contains R scripts. Currently it's empty because it's just a shell. Um, namespace file, um, which among other things kind of says which, which functions your package is exporting, a description file, um, and then a few things for me to, to get. Um, right. Uh, so basically, with, with use this, I've created all, I've put in place all of the, the folders and the files that I need to get, get cracking and developing a package. So the same is going to be true of um, the HTML widgets package. So I'll just take this script. Um, from the slides, the HTML widgets scaffold widget. So just as use this is um, create package function is kind of created scaffolding for a package, so too will this function create the scaffolding for uh, uh, for a widget. So let me just go ahead and execute this. I'm giving the widget some arbitrary name on a widget. So here you can see, um, you know, in the console. I created boilerplate, uh, boilerplate um, uh, pieces for the widget, and indeed those things have actually been opened in, in, in the user interface here. So I've got three files that have been created. Uh, first one, um, an R script, which uh, basically just you know captures from uh, for the R user the um, uh, certain parameters and passes them on the JavaScript. I'll come back to these in, in detail in, 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 a, in a pretty short order. Um, the second, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is uh, a JavaScript uh, JavaScript uh, script uh, which basically takes those uh, parameters from R and does something with them in the browser. And the third third piece is this this uh, this YAML, right? Uh, currently, it's commented out, but you know, in in the comments, you can see what's needed. So uh, basically, I, I want to uncomment all of these lines. And indicate, you know, in proper YAML format the dependencies. So the name of the dependency, its port, version, um, where to find, where to find the source file, uh, and if there are any kind of CSS style sheets, uh, where to find those things. Um, we'll come to that in later chapters, but I just wanted to give a heads up that this is one of the pieces of boilerplate that one would need to fill out uh, if, if, if your your um, your widget um, has any external JavaScript dependencies. Right. Okay. Um, good. So right now, actually, we have a working widget, believe it or not. Um, and I'll just, since we're now in the package, 
package universe. Um, whoops, sorry. Full of dev tools. Don't need to do this, but um, this is just going to create some documentation for me. Uh, so now you see that there's a man directory that's been created with, uh, with uh, the documentation. And um, now I'll, I'll load all of my functions. So this is kind of equivalent to, uh, you know, if you're just working interactively uh, of just uh, running running the scripts to contain your, your function definitions. So now my functions are available to me. Um, right. Uh, and I'm just going to run this little my my widget function. Pass it a single message. Hello world. Very inventive, I know. Uh, and you'll see that uh, magically um, in our viewer we have hello world. Um, and so this is really uh, basically what our function has done is it's taken a message that we've, we've provided through R. That, that message has been passed to JavaScript, uh, and then it's been inserted in the text on, on, the, on the page. Um, so that's kind of interesting that, you know, already I've, I've got a, with, the, with two lines of code and one, one, uh, one little function, I, I already have a, a, working, a working widget whose outputs I can, I can show. Um, before we go any further, I, I wanted to kind of give a little bit of a, 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 a rather, next slide, now that we have a kind of a working widget, I wanted to give a little bit of a, a tour of, I wanted to pop the hood on this and give a little bit of a tour of all of the files and give a sense of what they're doing. I've mentioned already in, in short what they're doing, but I wanted to have, have let us have a look in a little bit more detail of what's, of what's going on. Um, so first, I'll do a little bit of a guided tour here of uh, of the my widget dot bar, right? Which is again this, this R function that, that that creates our widget, if you will. There there are a few functions here that you'll find, and this is all boilerplate. Remember, I, I to this point I've really touched nothing. Uh, the first first function here is called my widget, um, which basically, um, in, in short, simply takes some parameters from the, the R user, uh, puts them into a list, and then passes them to the JavaScript function. Um, right? uh, then there are two other functions that are that are here that are going to be of interest to us, particularly, I guess, as we touch more on the shiny pieces. Uh, so this is kind of a general binding to JavaScript, and these are uh, kind of some bindings for, for, for Shiny. So basically, we're creating for our widget um, an output function, a Shiny output function, and a Shiny vendor function. Right? That's kind of the, the short version of it. So the, um, sure. I don't know. I mean, um, myself and Ryan certainly fluent with Shiny. Um, Lucio, are you okay with? Um, you you know what these uh, render and output functions that their purpose is. Yeah, I have also worked with Shiny. Cool, cool, cool. Sorry, I was just putting into chat. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. I mean, that, that's a great, great, great point, Russ. I mean, basically, the render and output functions are are, are for you know, so one function you'll have kind of in, uh, on, the, on the server side function and, and, and Shiny, and then on the other side. On the UI side to basically kind of display the way, display the results. You'd need both of these these functions to kind of have some kind of business logic be done on the server side, and then to show uh, in Shiny kind of the the, the result uh, in your Shiny app um, in, in the user interface. Um, coming coming back to this this widget or this is my widget function, um, it's it's really. At the present, it's pretty simple. You can imagine this getting more complicated, but uh, what's going on is, is, is as follows. We're capturing um, here you know, a few parameters. Let's concentrate first on, on message. We're capturing this message parameter. We're putting it into a list. Maybe seems kind of a, a silly thing to do um, since we only have one parameter. Um, but we're, in any event, we're, we're, we're capturing the message. We're putting it into a list object and then passing that object to, to, to our widget. Um, remember, remember when we kind of in the pre-write chapters we were talking about how we're going to be working with with uh, uh, with, with the JSON and, and, and JSON is somewhat akin to a, a list. Uh, oftentimes, JSON objects are very much akin to a list. 
in, uh, in, in R, nameless in R. So basically what we're going to do is we're taking this, this object R and, and behind the scenes is kind of getting serialized in, into a JSON object. Um, you know, a named JSON object. So we'll have you know kind of a message and then some some message that will that will that will appear. Um, uh, and you can easily imagine we could, we could have other things that we might want to to capture here and provide to the list, right? You know, I mean, this is a very silly app where we're just taking some string and putting the string into into a web page. But if we're dealing with an app, maybe it might be some parameters about uh, the the display of the data visualization. You know what. What color lines should be? What data we're passing to uh, to the app, etc. But really, you know, this mess, this kind of basic setup kind of provides the intuition. We're just capturing some some parameters, putting into a list, uh, a form, you know, a form that uh, can easily be serialized into JSON and then passing it to 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 the app. Um, let's let's have a look kind of on on, on the JavaScript side now uh, as to what's what's going on. So here we have um, we have a widget named my widget um, that produces an output, and then within this function, it's called this factory function, where it basically have two two functions that are that are provided to us. Um, one is resizing, which we won't touch, well, I'll touch on today, but you know, as you might imagine, it, it's the kind of the sizing the sizing of the app. Um, here, you just have the boilerplate you know, the function exists and you can define the contents of it. Uh, and, and then the second, the second uh, function we have here uh, is, is, uh, is, is rendering the value. So we're just taking um, X, uh, which, get, which is getting passed. I presume uh, in JavaScript, it's kind of a global variable. You know, it's kind of scope is it, it, it's global. So it's not, there's no argument X here. Um, and, and then we're, we're taking from X the, the message Element of the of the list, I guess I'll talk in R terms here, um, and then putting it into the inner text of this element. So the, the element that we're affecting on, on, the, on the browser page. So you know, we, remember again, we have this this object, uh, this uh, uh, object X, which which has a, an element message. Uh, we're taking simply taking the the value of that message, which is a string, and then passing it to the this element here. Uh, and then that's the value that's getting displayed on 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 page on the browser page. Any any questions so far? Um, not particularly. Um, yeah, I, um, I was I I was interested in I. <laughs> I was I was looking at the, the the kind of the output and render function for the um, widgets and trying to work out where how how they know which um, um, JavaScript widget to call. Presumably, it's based on this. Um, what would it be? Underplay, shiny widget output, and then the name play in there as a uh, sorry in the name. What is it? My widget in yours. The second argument there, and with that knowledge, you at you on the on the browser side, you know which script to use to to render content into uh, sorry I'm yeah Russ, I, I think you've kind of touched on something that remains a little bit of a mystery to me i i didn't have the time but you know i kind of suspect a lot of that's getting managed by this html create widgets mm. uh function um you know i look i look on the html widgets website and, and uh, you know whereas they have some documents that kind of broadly say you know, what's what HTML widgets does, uh, and you know, they also give a work example. It wasn't, I, I didn't, I didn't kind of look at the source code, and I didn't seem to get any like, function documentation. But I'm sure a lot of that gets gets managed um, uh, through 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 that, or, or perhaps on the side of JavaScript, which unfortunately I, I I don't I don't fully know. Like how is you know we have these three things, and I'm doing a lot of hand waving here, saying that they're connected. How, how indeed are they kind of mechanically connected? I, I, I can't 
I'm not sure that I have a full full grasp of that, but sure. you know, my my presumption is the same as yours. Is somehow they, through this through this name. Maybe the maybe the expression has to render my widget. Do do you maybe you pass in my widget of some values into that as your expression? I've just it just seems strange that neither of the shiny functions call the my widget function to me, but it, uh, maybe it's yeah, just that's, a misunderstanding. That's, that's a good point. Well, Russ, the, the thing that I'm caught with, and to continue the thought, if you notice at line 44, where we are calling HTML widgets as a, as a package, yeah. and then calling on the shiny widget output function, passing output ID, my widget with height, and then the package ah. pointing at the my package. So the, the first thing that, that Arthur had completed initially was to create the package, the environment that your HTML widget is sitting in. Mm -hmm. So we're pointing at package, my package, and then we're, we're focusing on the, my widget JavaScript inside that package. Am I saying that correctly? So like by, by calling on that second line of text, creating this, my widget, uh, that, that boiler plated out all of your values, it's just auto populating that my widget, name yeah there you go I, i'm assuming that's where the environment is pointing at that that stored media the the value x and then x is handed off into the javascript world and then re uh it's, it's the word i'm looking for when you're connecting the dots we have this name variable that we're pointing at called X within R, and then now it becomes my widget within JavaScript. Does that make sense? Mm. And I could be completely incorrect in that regard. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to put in, but I, yeah, it, it did seem a bit strange. Um, what I, I found. It, it, I think, uh, I, well, I mean, how, how it does it on the internals, I guess, remains to be. Theme, but just kind of uh, looking looking at this together, I was just looking at the documentation as, as they're talking. Um, so you know these arguments, you know here here I'm looking to a package for a widget. So you know the package argument is a package containing the widget um, with the name name. Um, I guess the, the, and then we're specifying the name here my 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 widget. Um, I'm guessing in, in the internals on how it it it, 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 it ends up. Calling this um, but that's that's an assumption. The thing that's that's triggering my OCD is line forty nine, where you see lowercase render and then capital M my widget. Um, that immediately uh, itched at the back of my mind because I'm like, well, wait a second, why is it capital M? That doesn't register. If we're calling it lowercase my underscore widget lowercase, and then with a capital M. That that kind of tweaked me a little bit um, looking at, at the way you're calling, but I'm I'm guessing in that that rendering output side of the uh, server end um, that name doesn't it's not important. You're you could probably populate it with anything because you're just putting a function attached to it, and that function has the instructions on what you're doing. Um, I think it's just a function, and I'm guessing you know as the boilerplate gets generated, they're just following. This, you know, case convention. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Good point. Shiny, so. I mean, maybe there's more to it. Um, um, yeah, good. Really good questions. Um, so I guess let's kind of briefly an overview of um, a little bit of more of the details on kind of our side on what, what the boilerplate is, is, is doing for us, you know, creating this my widget function. Um, and then two two shiny functions, you know, one for the server side, one for, for the UI side. Um, I guess I'll do all my homework after this and, and, and see actually if this shiny widget is, is like is making a call. Because then like in a sense, I guess you could construct, you 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 can make a call, right? So this is kind of the namespace, and then this is a function, right? Um, and then these are some of the other parameters. 
Um, anyway, that's that's an interesting question. Um, uh, anyway, so we did an overview of the uh, uh, of the R script uh, and, and the functions that kind of the boilerplate creates, uh, and then the JavaScript. That's a little bit on the out the input side. I, I wanted to kind of look together on on the output side, um, just to look at this in an actual browser, um, so we can get maybe a better sense of, of of what this is actually doing doing for us. So I use the developer settings uh, to inspect the page. Um, and here we can see kind of a few interesting bits. Um, quick check in is, is this too small? Should I increase the size? Okay, I, I think I, I saw running off. It's okay. Um, and, and so here, you know, basically what we're, what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're populating a um, populating contents of this, of this div, um, this HTML widget container. Um, and we can see here that, uh, you know, we've, we've got a few other things, but the, I think the thing, you know, that we, we have right here is this hello world, right? Uh, so inside, we basically kind of populated the inner text of this, of this div with hello, hello world through JavaScript. So we've taken this, oh, sorry, um, this, uh, the message that we passed to the function, um, put into the inner, um, the inner text uh, of this div. Um, so that on the page we see we see hello hello world right um, the other the other things worth noting about kind of, kind of what we've done in the end with, with the page itself um, is you know if we look to the head um, we'll, we can see that we've actually we've, we've actually inputted we've, we've um, put in a few of our dependencies right so here we have uh, a dependency on HTML widgets .js. Uh, so I guess the JavaScript coming from HTML widgets that makes all of this possible, uh, and, as well as um, the widget, um, our widget binding. Um, so we, we see my underscore widget dash binding, and then this uh, um, these numbers that follow are basically kind of the semantic version number of, of, of our widget. So since we're in development uh, mode right now, it's just this 0 .0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.9000. 0 uh, so basically, it, it depends on a version of our of our package, uh, our, and our package, of course, contains this, this my widget uh, JavaScript. Um, so we we've introduced in the page some two we loaded two dependencies um, uh, from external libraries, uh, HTML widgets, uh, and then our our widget. Um, Brian, it looks like you you have a question. I as I say, I, I have a quick comment. So uh, in the relation of the two uh, script lines, uh, you're calling on your local library uh, yes. with HTML widgets and the my widgets binding. Those two instructions, we'll call them JavaScript instructions or files, those two are local to your machine. And I'm presuming that because it's a local service, that when you created your HTML widgets call from R, that contained those files that were downloaded and loaded into namespace of your package. Um, where I'm making the reference is that in that those two lines, if those would be external to your to your application, say you're using some kind of a CDN type pointer at some other library, when you render or when you open your web browser, the HTML, the document object model is going to reach out to that location and pull those libraries in. Um, right now, within this context, it's local to your machine. You're just pointing at files that are already existing uh, when we created this, this environment. If it were a true web page, you, could you point at some other library outside external? And if so, where would that come in at? Where, uh, within your, your R script, where would you make those references and i that may be too advanced of a question for this topic but so i think that's coming i guess let me give you a few cracks as an answer uh, on that question Ryan. so one is I, I think if we were indeed using something that were external uh we would have to specify that this, this yaml document and I, I'm, I'm, uh, I presume that you know this uh each email tools kind of dark dark magic would basically kind of look at the yaml file um, and then take take the source, uh, you know, um, from here, and then and then populate the header of our of our page. 
So that's, I think, for things that are kind of truly external, where we're getting, you know, from, you know, CDN or somewhere that's, that's external to our machine. But I guess for, for these two things, my, you know, um, that we're seeing here, I think these are always going to be local uh, in, in the sense that, you know, they're coming, they're coming from our R library, um, uh, it, 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 I, I believe. I think they're coming from our, our, our R library. So, you know, it happens that it's on my local machine that I'm using to demo. So it's looking at my R library. I guess in this case, maybe my kind of uh, package, package uh, library for, for, for this. Um, and, and then if we are working on, like, let's say, R Studio, you know, some kind of R Studio product, um, this would this would come from from, from that, that machine. Um, I would I would I would um, yeah, great, great questions on that. Um, I'll be interested to see how this this bit works in coming chapters. My intuition, my strong intuition is that that's 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 where our we'll we'll specify kind of the pointers of the, the uh, external locations of, of, of other of other dependencies that we'll we'll load into the page. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I had a look in a couple of um, libraries that are, uh, sorry, of R packages that use um, HTML widgets. And so I've looked at leaflet and digraphs. And for both of them in that YAML file, the, um, you know, the, the, the script locations are, um, um, they are paths within the R package, so they're in the ins directory. So you, your 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 oh, source cool. would be HTML widget slash lib slash jQuery. So you, um, I there probably are examples of using CDNs, but um, um, I I'd have to search a bit more. But yeah, certainly if I mean if you've got your R package installed on, um your local machine then um when you render a you know render to the browser something built on html widgets you will have access to the the, the relevant scripts but supposing you've installed on like shinyapps.io or something like that again any r package upon which it's based w will be installed on that server and presumably you just transfer the scripts over to um the browser whenever the user opens them. So I, d I don't know whether, it, I don't think it would be necessary to, to, to use a CDN a lot of the time, but also I imagine using the CDN might be a bit flaky in this setting because, um, you know, the URLs can change and things like that. But, um, I don't know. but something we would, um, John mentioned last week after our meeting was that maybe we ought to discuss licensing because if you're packaging up someone's here, packaging up someone's JavaScript libraries within your own R package or using them in a uh, work project or something like that, you have to be quite aware of the, you know, whether you're allowed to share the code whether you're allowed to use the code freely and things like that. Um, yeah, certainly something we didn't talk about. But yeah, I, I imagine if you did need to use a CDN, this would be the place, this file, this YAML would be the place where you encode it. But I can't find any good examples of people who are doing that with, um, yeah. So. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for us. Um, Maybe we'll continue to look for <clears throat> such examples, but um, yeah, I mean, it looks so far, at least based on this this example, uh, I think maybe a few others I've seen, like all of the all of the code that you need is kind of locally sourced through through the through the libraries that you that you install um, and load on um, on whichever machine is kind of um, is is serving up the page. Uh, if you could go, yeah, this is this this is something that I find quite interesting. The um, in the script, um, the first of the two script things in the body of this HTML here, where you're um, 
it, it's script type is application slash JSON data for. Now the data for attribute, I was trying to find more examples of like this data because what, what it is, it's, it's kind of a, a place in the HTML that holds the data that will subsequently be used by the HTML widget dash random number um, div. Um, is is that data the, the the data slash for attribute? Is that a a, a common HTML um, concept? I've seen it within Shiny apps before, but I don't know whether it's a. Um, I, sorry, I did have a look. Up. I did Google. I'm not just asking you to Google for me, but um, <laughs> um, but I couldn't find any kind of like um, even things like the Mozilla. Web docs didn't really mention the uh, how to whether that's like a, a typical way of encoding on the web that um, one part of the HTML document contains the data that should be used in a separate part of the HTML document. Um, it may well be, but I, I, I mean, I'm not chiefly a, a web developer, but. Um, yeah, it, it was quite an interesting little attribute that I don't see, I hadn't seen much outside of Shiny before. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Russ. Uh, I, I hadn't dug into that, so I'm, I'm now kind of keen to, 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 to look at that. Um, yeah, I, I kind of want to come to the script, the script bit of the, you know, since the body, or the bottom um, of, of, the, of the page, of the, the body of the page. And this is basically where, um, you know, my understanding is this is where any, any script that we would have here would kind of be would be put. Or these things from JSON we kind of pass to, to, to this to this location. Um, so you know you have the scripts that are kind of loaded text that are, that are kind of sourced uh, or you know say loading libraries. I guess that would be kind of the equivalent in our world is done up here, but there there could be additional scripts that would, would be loaded. Yeah, for the data for, I guess we'll maybe see in, in, in subsequent chapters. I did, I did peek at, I did peek ahead, and I think I, I saw for at least one case. Um, yeah, I mean this this is where you're, you're, if the page you're passing data through. So like we're, we're only passing, you know, message, you know, we're only passing something to the output. There must be a JavaScript mechanism for passing passing the data to this data this data for. Um, but I seem to recall that uh, this must have been for. Um, some simple charting library, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but we're going to see I think it's the next chapter, the chapter thereafter. There's simply just a, a list, a list of, of, of data points, right? Um, so the data we're kind of pipe, yeah. piped in, piped here, uh, and then the JavaScript uh, uh, library did something with that in terms of it put those as input data and then displayed them somehow based on its kind of internal, internal logic. No, I just thought it was quite neat because the examples I was presenting last week, um, there was uh, f f there were three different examples all doing the same kind of thing. So you defined an element into which you uh, a appended a plot, but the the script that generated that plot, the the JavaScript, the browser side script that generated it, had all the data necessary kind of hard coded into it. And I just thought it was quite neat that there was a system to separate the the data content from the script that ultimately um, renders that into to the image that's presented to the user. Um, just for the you know simplicity of like you know you don't want to have to trail through potentially thousands of symbols worth of data in order to find the script that you uh, need to modify in when you're debugging in the browser or something but um, yeah so um, cool yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's uh that's interesting you know i'll, I'll look up i'll definitely look at after this this uh this meeting to kind of see what how that how that works um but, I mean, Russ, you're saying that this data for is it's, it's common and shiny without, without the widgets. Without 
Possibly, but I think it may well just be that all I've seen is HTML widgets in embedded in Shiny, and that's where this has come from. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's just an HTML widgets kind of thing rather than something common to web standards or something. But I, mean, I wonder if it's also library specific because um, I was in charts.js. I think they, they have a like a, can, a canvas uh, element that uh, uses the canvas tag. Um, uh, I mean, in lieu of a div, uh, maybe it's just that indeed the data are stored here and then maybe they're rendered in, in the div through, through the logic of, or I guess in the case of the, the charts.js, you know, the canvas tag. Anyway, that'll be a thread that be interesting to kind of follow uh, going forward. Um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I guess one way I'm just from this is, you know, on the one hand, sure you have kind of the in, inputs, if I can put it that way, you know, all, all of the machinery within R, uh, we define functions to take parameters, pass them to JavaScript, um, within JavaScript to do some, some, some work and pass something to the browser and then and separately and connected to the JavaScript is, you know, this thing, this thing the JavaScript dependency um, for, for your, uh, for your JavaScript, uh, the JavaScript library that you're, you're utilizing here. Um, the other thing I guess we can do is really just a little bit more playing around. Um, is it, just showing you know what what you can do with with, with this. So here we're doing nothing more than taking this the string and passing it to the, the inner text, the text within within the the tag. Within the div. Um, but there are many other things we could we could do as well. Um, so for example, if we're interested in seeing the object itself. Um, uh, something like this. The question is, is this the same thing? So here we can come to, um, you know, rather than looking at the elements of the page, we can actually come to the console uh, and, and see the object it, it itself. So here, uh, sorry, this is a bit, a bit small perhaps. Um, there we go. Um, we can see, you know, we can see our object, which is sort of a, a list, right? The named list uh, where we have um, as, as a key message and the value hello world. Also, we can maybe do other other things, uh, other things perhaps of, of, of interest here. Uh, maybe we can do uh, 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 modify my function here. I'll add a color parameter, and I'll basically this will allow me to kind of change the change the color of the of the text in the div. So this side of the back of the work um, the result of poorly prepared improvisation. Um, so then we have that. Uh, anyway, it didn't it didn't work out here. Um, but what I was endeavoring to do uh, yesterday, I forgot how was basically I can I can modify other things about this this, this bit. So my my hope was that I could modify the style 
um, the style of, 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 of this div. So add something to the style and see where that the, the height, the width, uh, and basically to add to that um, programmatically, but instead of just editing the, uh, the browser. So, but in principle, this, this, this could be done on I'm just um, messing up on the implementation here. Uh, for, you know, I'm hoping to capture as a parameter of my function the color, the color I want for this div. Um, taking this argument, putting it into x, pop. I think I see where it's going wrong. So, yeah, it works. Yeah, so my, my mistake here is that I was, I was trying to pluck my color kind of out of the ether um, instead of taking it from X, which is this, this list object that, that contains all the parameters that I'm passing, um, that I'm passing from R to, to, to JavaScript. Um, and here you can, you can see that I'm, I'm making some changes to the style of, of, of the div. So here you see color, color red, which, which appears right here. So I didn't hard code this, this is kind of a fresh instance of the page, where basically through, through R, a combination of R and JavaScript, I've kind of written that, I've written the style programmatically. So basically, you know, these are some simple examples, but one can imagine that you could, one could do quite a lot more through through, the, the, through JavaScript's access, you know, to to the page, the the, the DOM model, uh, the access to the page, you kind of access certain elements of the page and and, and change them programmatically. Um, obviously, the libraries, I guess, will will use them, uh, in in future. We'll, we'll kind of do that all through the the library itself, but. Here's the, the, the principle is just that you know JavaScript can, can make some changes, and those changes will, will be reflected in, um, in, in the page itself. Where where I you know I, I think that we're going with all this, you know, kind of harkening back to this, this function here is you know here we have a list where we can capture in the function lots of things um, and feed them into JavaScript. So uh, as you might imagine, these are probably going to be um, uh, Pieces of, of the, uh, the arguments of the JavaScript function. Um, so we're, we're going to be in the API of our function. Um, so the interface in our function, we're going to be capturing uh, arguments that are meaningful for the API of the of the JavaScript library. So that with R, we can provide instructions that will be duly received and executed by by, by JavaScript um, and then uh, written to the page. I don't know if there are any questions or comments um, at this stage. Um, no, I think that's quite a, it's quite a neat example to to show how to extend the um, the, um, the 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 kind of R function to have an effect on the browser just by changing the color. Yeah, it's quite cool. Um, so you would typically rather than because um, you mentioned last week that there was um, um, for some of the JavaScript libraries the the people who I think it must be John Cohen who wrote a lot of the APIs in R to wrap around the, the JavaScript version so you typically try to mimic the JavaScript API and so the the arguments that you can define for a JavaScript library you would add as a kind of named argument in your R function, would you? And then just pass them through to the. Um, yeah, that's that's my intuition, Russ. Yeah, um, yeah actually, um, I think I, I sent the wrong links uh, in last week's session. I guess what I wanted to show um, is so this this library that by, by John Cohen. Um, E charts for R. Um, I'll just look at one that I, I, I recently used. This gauge. Um, 
what's, what's kind of interesting here is you know, John's step is function e, you know, e gauge. So all of all of the charts are already having this prefix e underscore. Um, uh, you know, you've got this object. You kind of instantiate the chart object and and, 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 and the API. I, I guess it kind of is a bit linked that's done in uh, JavaScript. Um, you have some value for the gauge here. It's it's going to show kind of like a speedometer, if you will, and um, uh, some value, some name, and some other parameters. And what's interesting here is there's this also see also, um, which uh, then takes you on to the the documentation for. Um, for, for the gauge here. Uh, and then you can make all kinds of arbitrary changes, changes to the, the look and the feel of the gauge. Um, and, and it turns out that in order to make these changes, uh, each heart's drives, uh, I guess it's maybe a little bit sad that it took me a while to figure this out, but basically, you, you know, if you want to make a change in, in R, you basically pass a list, a name the list. Whose names are the same as the, the elements of like the JavaScript API. So in, in effect, you're basically creating a list of R. Um, it'll be serialized and kind of trans thus translated into something you know, exactly what the JavaScript library's API expects. A JSON, a JSON uh, object that, that gives a description of all of the relevant parameters, which which is kind of unique. I, I don't know if this is kind of deep, commonly done, but I thought this was a very clever way. To offer offer our users who are probably unfamiliar with with the JavaScript library, um, a, a way in which well, so I thought it was clever for you know multiple reasons. Number one, on the developer side, you know you, you know the developers not running after this moving library and creating and deprecating arguments as the underlying JavaScript library changes. Instead, you just provide a list whose arguments are going to fit whatever version of of, of, of the JavaScript library this this um, this, um, this package is, is, is targeting. Um, but also I thought it was really quite nice that you know here you're providing to the end user uh, all of the power of the JavaScript library um, and you're not having to create you know as a developer, I guess switching around back to developer, you're not having to, to document every bloody thing, but instead you know you're saying go and look at the documentation for, for this JavaScript library, which in this particular case, it turns out to be really quite good. Um, and then you can make all the little tweaks and changes that you, that you like. Um, but it must be that, you know, under the hood, I, I, I've not looked at this library of, of John's, you know, I've not looked at the source code in this sense, but it'd be interesting to see kind of, um, you know, how he basically kind of constructs this um, and how much what he constructs matches kind of the API of the JavaScript library itself. But you know, I think that's that's pretty much all I have for today. It was just really kind of a short demo that um, you know, hopefully kind of showed how simple it is to set up this, the, the boilerplate for a uh, um, for a widget, um, and then also kind of gave a little bit, uh, touched a little bit on uh, on how each what each component is and what it what it, what it does, albeit um, maybe with kind of a surface deep understanding that hopefully will. To deepen and mature over time for not only me but all of us. Um, and I guess the last thing I wanted to leave everyone with is, is, is actually a set of resources that I kind of found useful um, for uh, um, uh, either exploring this further or getting kind of a complementary view on things. So um, for treatments of HTML widgets, I found two that aren't in the book that might be helpful. So there's a little bit maybe more realistic example that, that it shows up in HTML widgets um, documentation. So it's basically creating a widget. It goes through a lot of the same things that John does, but with, a, I think, a bit more realistic um, realistic uh, use case. Um, so uh, I think John's, John's chapter helpfully starts with something very, very basic to establish the intuition. I guess if you want to dive deeper, in addition to what's shown in the next chapter, this might be a good entry point. Um, also, uh, you know, if you're more graphically inclined, uh, there's a, a nice set of slides from uh, this uh, uh, JavaScript for Shiny uh, workshop from the 2020R Studio Conference. Um, their CDN is kind of slow, it's taking a lot to render, but in any event, the, the links are there. Um, it, it shows, here's an overview of the HTML widgets as, as well. 
in a more graphical, more graphical way. And then lastly, if you want to dive into the JavaScript itself, something that I, if time will, will allow for me personally, I'd very much like to do. Um, this this uh, this workshop is really quite useful. Um, uh, so there's a whole set of materials uh, here um, on the the conference the conference page. Um, for whatever reason, this is really slow slow to load. But basically, it kind of walks through the JavaScript that the, the Chinese developer might might want to might, might want to know, and actually dives in, interestingly dives into some of the JavaScript itself, think more so than John's book does. Um, in addition to the training materials, it actually offers a, a, a workshop package um, that interestingly uh, provides a little bit of a JavaScript REPL um, uh, within, within R uh, so that, um, you know, I guess, I guess the idea being so that uh, R users who may not know much about JavaScript or how to set it up on their machines could kind of interact with JavaScript from a place uh, of comfort. So R and uh, R markdown documents. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to share that as a kind of a nice find that might be useful to, to us as we continue along this uh, learning path. Cool. Yeah, I found um, I found a couple of things that were quite interesting related to HTML widgets and and um, Shiny. Um, so on on the kind of Shiny tutorials pages at our studio dot com, there's um, a couple of things in a like the shiny extensions section on how to um, build a widget and how to um, incorporate HTML widgets into your um, um, apps. Um, and uh, the, the, there's a particularly nice one that I've mentioned in the um, chat for today where um, it's like they step you through how to make a kind of it's like a dashboard type thing and they they kind of hard code it as a script in some html first and then show you how to do it with html widgets and then show you how to embed that in a shiny app um which is quite neat i mean by i mean it's five years old but i i think it'll probably still um um hold up but yeah it, it seems quite a nice little kind of tutorial really um cool um was there something else that I, um well, i can't remember <laughs> while russ is searching and and to add arthur uh this has been a great presentation i mm -hmm. the 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 one element that i continually have difficulty with in relation to the javascript ecosystem in general is just the sheer volume of naming convention that they follow the wide array of different ways that you can achieve the same activity so like like what 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 tool do you want to use to create some you know application kind of thing and i i often quest down this long 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 path of comprehension just to realize well i could go do it over here on this service and i already had that installed kind of thing I, uh, I don't know if anybody else finds that um, the same uh, the same process or not. Russ, we've we've talked heavily on on packaging and and just shiny in general. The idea that that you create this environment in our studio that generates this you know web page output you know and how you're managing it et cetera, and then you realize well I could probably just come and do it from a different angle and achieve the same activity uh, the same appearance. Um, I don't know if anybody else finds that uh, same task or not. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, I, one thing I noted with the thing was, was that, like, the the way that HTML widgets pro builds the kind of boilerplate around your code um, kind of obliges you to name your widgets a particular way. So it seems that, like, if it in R, I'm kind of used to writing state case variables, but they look a little bit weird when they're, um, you know, a butting render or output with the, the kind of capitalized names. Um, so I have to change my um, 
change my style but uh that, that that's a ra rather minor thing but i think it's quite nice in that like you're you're obliging the user to use variable names that are kind of consistent with how you would write javascript traditionally where you might more typically use kind of camel case than snake case but um yeah uh cool anyway um oh yeah the other thing i was going to mention there's um there's there's a chapter in the r markdown the definitive guide on html widgets which is another place where you might um reasonably use it i know that i've talked about shiny a lot but um yeah uh so there's a nice little chapter there on kind of writing you know incorporating html widgets into um into markdown documents um and also on how to create uh widgets as well um and i think this is a i think this is the same library as the example you showed earlier on after the um the, the the library that they're using there yeah i think i think you're exactly right russ uh they reuse a sigma js uh, example um it may actually be that all of the text in this thing good good on them for using material i suppose but uh, yeah it is stuff. cool right um yes so um yeah no that was um it's 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 nice this chapter though the uh, sorry not the the r markdown one the one in javascript for r in that you're you're kind of introducing in quite small steps how to build these things and like really all you need is to be able to do a bit of text manipulation to to understand how you can link one language with the other and and how you can present in one um medium that wouldn't be typical of, of our um next week will probably be a lot more complicated um but yeah it's it's quite nice that the 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 process the boilerplate and stuff it will, will probably build on the same um foundations but cool um we don't have a presenter for, for next week yet um I I threw my name in there, Russ. I okay, I cool. added it to the Google oh, Sheets. Okay. okay, that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, yeah, no, that's brilliant. Um, it it does look at uh, it might be a long chapter. I don't know. Um, don't strive to do the whole of the chapter if it's too much <laughs> too much to do in an hour. Um, Copy that. Uh, but you know, just pick out the interesting points and and things. Um, and then the following week, there's a, another chapter about, um, oh yeah, they wrap an even more complicated library. So the one next week is a kind of, it's a library where you can add, you know, like little pie charts and things like that in, in line, in text. The following week is one where you're kind of uh, you can impose data upon a globe in a way that the user can kind of uh, manipulate the, the globe and whatnot. Um, yeah, cool. Um, thanks ever so much, Arthur. Uh, that was great. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, cool. Um, we'll continue the discussion in the Slack channel if, if, um, if you like. And um, good to see you all. I will head off and have a nice evening in the sun <laughs> for a change. <laughs> cool. Um, right. See you later. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All the best. Bye -bye. Take care.